Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, yes, so I'm Julie McCann. I'm from the Department of Computing. And I have to sort of fess up because I don't do anything in space. In fact, I probably do the complete opposite. But I hope by the end of the talk today, you'll get a feel of where I think the work that I'm doing can be taken to those kinds of hardware and software systems that we find in the gi giant arena of, of space things and so on. And to that end, what I want to show is a bit of background to talk about the challenges that we have in our kinds of systems. Then I'll talk about the kinds of solutions that we've provided, and then we'll wrap up from there. And the, the sort of approach that I'm taking is that perhaps you can see uh, elements where one can contribute or collaborate with the work that we're doing. Okay, so to follow from the previous talk, we actually are very much tied to the ground in the sense that I'm working on wireless sensor network. So what is a wireless sensor network? Well, um, this is, for those who are not familiar with it, this is where basically technology has been miniaturized to such a degree that we now have the situation where we can bring fairly decent processing power to be battery powered and uh, then we can put on things like uh, reasonably robust sensing equipment and also we can have um, transceivers to allow us to build these tiny little sensing uh, nodes or systems and these can be put into space and allow us to understand what's happening in that space. So this is all accumulated and this, this, this technology, let's say convergence happened about 12 or 15 years ago. And ever since then now we've been playing with these little sensors, we've been building networks of them and we've been trying to explore their capabilities and so on. Now it was predicted back then that these would become quite miniaturized down to something like we could see here. To be honest, most of this time we are playing with something around this size. The other thing to note about these systems, even though we're managing to pack a fair amount of computing power into these microcontrollers, they're actually still relatively dumb compared to your mobile phone, for example. So essentially, what we're trying to do is squeeze the most intelligence and so on out of these systems by uh, forming a sum of the parts calculation, by making the network become the smart part of the system. So basically, it's larger. The capacity of these systems are larger than the sum of the parts. Now, typically, these kinds of uh, computing systems follow the following uh, computer systems architecture, where at the bottom here, we can see that we have embedded in some form of reality, whether it's a field or in somebody's office or whatever, we have these sensors. And these sensors, as I say, have antennae, which allow them to speak in a form of a network to each other, or in fact, relay data back up to some form of, let's say, a more intelligent system. This we sometimes call a cluster head or a base station. From here, we can either go directly via satellite to some sort of server system, and that's where the data is typically processed on bulk. So that could be cloud-based system and so on. And there, it's basically where we could be actually plugging these kinds of pieces of data into other models that are pulling data from, for example, more remote sources. We can also uh, utilize other mechanisms to allow this data to be moved around or shipped around an infrastructure. This could be via, for example, cars, and we sometimes nickname this uh, a data mule using what's called opportunistic sen uh, sensing and networking, and I'll come back to that later on. As you all probably know, uh, these can be used to embed, uh, uh, these sensors can be embedded in space and so on, and we've used them in the past for, for example, we have a vineyard out in Dorking where we're putting sensors in there to understand, better understand how a new variety of grape is faring in the different, comp the different parts of their spaces so that we can see where it grows properly given the climate that we have in the UK. We also have embedded them in things and in fact we've got a couple of decaying sensors in uh, the Queen's Tower right now that need replacing of batteries. Um, and we, we managed to use those to allow us to have early warning uh, of structural failure and so on. And we also use them in, in things like smart cars, smart grid technology and so on. So this, these tiny little pieces of technology actually are quite uh, ubiquitous in the sense that they can be placed in lots of different situations and uh, be applied to lots of different applications. So that's what I look at. Now let's look at the challenges of trying to build applications out of these little systems. The first large challenge is noise, and the first challenge itself comes from the sensors. 
not unlike what some of you guys in the remote sensing world would have also. So we obviously are at the lower end of the sensing spectrum in the sense that we're at the cheaper end, therefore the probability of sensor failure and the probability of the data not being as accurate as you would hope it would be starts to get higher. So instead of being deterministic about it, what we have done is we have tried to better understand the behaviors of these sensors and to better understand when they start to fail or their, their, their results are less trustworthy and so on and try to cope with that. So we're not trying to work around failure, we're trying to cope with the failure. And in doing so, we've built models of trustworthiness uh, that allows us to ship the data back to the cloud system or wherever for analytics uh, and bring with it a notion of what we think is the level of trustworthiness of that data at that moment in time coming in from that batch or individual sensor. The means of communicating the data across the actual sensor network or via uh, higher networks is also an issue. In terms of we have issues with communications interference, uh, that means that we have to make sure that the protocols that we put onto these systems don't mean that the actual network is starting to come down because all the communications are starting to consume the bandwidth. We have to look at link um, uh, contention in the sense that we have to understand better how to maximize the, uh, the opportunity to communicate with another device. And we have to, uh, in our systems, not unlike some satellite systems, we are also unidirectional. In other words, we can send and then we can listen. And we have to understand that, that can be asymmetrical in the sense that I might be able to hear you, but you may not be able to hear me right now, given environmental conditions. And a lot of these systems, because of the nature of the antenna we, we're using, um, it's essentially a broadcast medium. Now, we can exploit that for some protocols, or we have to rein that in, because we have an issue with some systems overhearing what we're broadcasting. And that, again, that overhearing actually costs us. And when I talk about costs, I'm talking about running down the battery, because a lot of these systems are battery powered, or consuming some other resource on the processor or within the actual unit itself. So we have to minimize those costs. Furthermore, the actual nodes themselves, the, the devices themselves, are using my controllers, which are not unlike probably what you would have been playing with in the 1980s if you were playing with the ZX Spectrum. Okay, so you can have a look at the sort of capacity we're looking for here. So for RAM, we have to be very frugal in terms of programming. And yet, I'm saying to you now that I have to make these more smart, as smart as a modern computer system. So we have clever tricks that allows us to optimize the system, to squeeze as much as possible out of these kinds of systems, given this low resource ability. And the one thing that, that we're particularly interested in is how we try to understand the environment in which the sensor node, the sensing devices themselves are in to better optimize their behaviors, uh, to better understand their behaviors and further optimize, predict potential failures, how to route around those failures and so on. And we have that pre-programmed into our algorithm so that when the situation arises that would normally bring down a normal system, we can route down around those failures um, on demand in a self-adaptive way. And then the bottom line here, what I wanted to mention was that we typically, in some of our applications, uh, feed the data that comes from those kinds of systems. We maybe do some pre-processing of the data. As I say, we might mark it up to give an indication of trustworthiness. And then that shipped up the network in various different ways. It may be summarized as it goes up the network. And it tends to end up in somebody's model somewhere to, to make meaningful uh, information out of that. So for example, with Reading University, we use jewels and scope models. I am not going to talk about the big data end of this conversation. We have a, a data science institute that covers that. So if you're interested in all the heavy data analytics, cloud computing and so on, that's their end of things. I'm down at the tiny, small, ugly end of computing. <laughs> Okay, so now there's, I'm not the only person in the world to be looking at this as a subject area. We have a particular approach in my research group, which is to look at this area and try to build what we call distributed autonomic computing systems. Distributed in the sense that we try to minimize the number of centralized control components in the sense that the computer system itself knows how to evolve a better plan of operation rather than have it dictated by some central point meaning the central point of failure, and also it means that uh, all the systems have to communicate to that which costs. Autonomic, what does that mean? Well, basically that's a term borrowed uh, from uh, medical 
Irene is, and that's where the system is not only doing its job, but it's also monitoring its own behavior. And in doing so, it's able to correct itself or ask for help to correct itself. And I'll give examples later on of how we do that. Now, because we're looking at the smaller end of computing, what we have found over the last 10 years that it has been very easy for us to borrow from how nature actually does similar things. If you look at, for example, swarm-based uh, swarm system in nature, they tend to, as individuals, have not much, let's say, processing power or ability or capability or intelligence, but as a network, they're able to protect themselves find and hunt out resources and so on. And it's that same approach that we have taken in building our systems. And in truth, we have borrowed from nature directly from the sense of using swarm systems, gossip, um, uh, propagation of messages and so on. So we have used nature almost directly. And again, I'll show you an example of that. And as I mentioned before, one of the things that we are known for uh, in terms of research is being able to have this notion of the self in the computer system uh, in the, and so that the computer system is able to report on itself and able to try and heal itself. And that's what we mean by self-star. If you ever see the self-star thing in a computing environment, it means self-configuring, self-healing, self-optimizing, and so on. So that, that is that notion of being able to understand what its goals are and how to try and meet them given adverse or degrees of adversity. So I had to look to see what the science or the space world uh, was looking for out of technology. And I came up with the following three slides. Uh, this is from numbers of reports um, that are talking about slightly more future uh, technologies. But I do think from what I've learned today that it's not just future. So if we're talking about global scale sensing, what do they have in common with us? Well, there seems to be a, a, a sort of... Um, trajectory towards the Pico and Nano satellites. And I've been looking at what, what the requirements, the computer and hardware requirements of these kinds of systems are. The first one is that they're lightweight and they, like us, have limited resources. Um, in terms of the actual nodes, the microcontrollers themselves, and what I did find, which was very amusing for me, was some of those satellites use the exact same microcontrollers that we're using on our systems, uh, but we're shoving them in the ground rather than having them fly. Um, in terms of communications, the communications down to the details are not exactly the same, but some of the tricks that we use to make sure that our data gets from X to Y are also being looked at in terms of these systems. And of course, if these guys are going to fly, they're going to be on some sort of either um, solar power or battery power. And again, we've been playing around with that for now 10 years, and we're able to understand how to get the maximum, given the controllers, given the communications, given the sensor equipment, how to ma maximize the resources that we've got on board. And so, for example, we are looking at uh, different algorithms to allow for distributed computation, for things like to better understand, if you're sensing globally, the coverage of an environment, how to understand whether it's a uniform coverage one wants, or they're looking for particular areas, how to adapt as the area changes itself spatially and temporally, um, how to actually move the system around. So, for example, some of our sensors are also mobile, and we can also understand the idea of flocking those. And we have been using UAVs as well to flock um, uh, basically data retrieval uh, quadcopters uh, in, in a space to, to overcome having a general, let's say, infrastructure failure. We're looking at communications reliability, as you guys are. Um, we're looking at different ways to route the data through an environment. So instead of having uh, a straight X to Y communications, that we may build relays of some sort. Those relays could be fixed relays. They could be mobile relays. And there's obviously the optimization within that to move those relays around, given the current environment, to maximize the chance of that communications getting through. We're also interested in the conversation about capacity and the radio uh, or other networks' capacities and how to maximize that and what other tricks, again, we can use in that with regards to avoiding interference and when to actually put the system to sleep so that we can both save on interference and save on whatever means that we're powering the system up. And when we put systems to sleep, when they're at this low end of computing, when they go to sleep, they start to desynchronize. They um, the microcontrollers clocks start to become, they start to drift because they are on the cheap end of uh, computing and therefore we have to bring those systems back up, ensure they're back up at the same time and able to bounce the communications and, uh, message across that field.
So we are doing that sort of thing too. And that's exactly what I found is the challenges for these kinds of systems. They too have explicitly asked for dynamic and self-adaptive computing infrastructures and have that from the very coding of the system upwards, not bolted on afterwards. Other things that I've come across are things like, for example, that they're now starting to say that agencies will be, uh, let's say, providing services for each other and for uh, third party uh, agencies, I suppose. And with that, that starts to bring across some of the issues that we have had as well, where other not the agencies in our case, other service providers are using the same equipment as say, for example, a water company using the same equipment as TFL and so on to, to route data across the system. We have the same challenges there in terms of what would the packets look like or the bundles or whatever look like. How do we format them? How do we schedule the communications across those shared resources? Um, interoperability of the data that's coming in and so on and so forth. How do we get those systems to talk to each other and those kind of things. And those are similar challenges. And uh, The reason I bring that up is because those challenges are just that little bit harder if we're down at the cheaper end of the more mobile uh, computing uh, infrastructures. Um, Another big problem that's a big issue with these systems similar to us is code propagation. That is where you have a system in operation for a while, you discover a bug and you want to update or upgrade the system. And that's non-trivial given that you have an active system that's running on uh, relatively low resources. You can't exactly just stop it and bring up the code updates. There has to be cleverer ways to inject new code and bug, bug fixes and so on. And it's not like traditional computing for many of these systems. We've come across ways of doing that in a very gradual sort of trickle, literally trickle way. And these can be brought into these kinds of systems too. Obviously, safety and security are paramount. And in our kinds of systems, we have problems with, for example, where false data is injected into the computing system. And if that false data is injected either as data or worse, as control, then we can see behaviors that we are not anticipating or welcoming. And we have to be able to accommodate for that and make sure that that doesn't get through to our system or that the system isn't even, if it's going to be physically compromised, at least we have given some sort of warning of that. And this is back to the self again, where the system is monitoring its own behavior and also its environment, i.e. the boxes that surround it and so on. So in terms of uh, communications returning to that, um, We've already seen in some Mars missions that relaying data is better than going directly. And as I said before, we do this multi-hop routing. It's his bread and butter to us, so that we know this pretty well. Um, as I said before, we mentioned uh, positioning of the relays in a space is important because and if it's able to move also, understanding that and optimizing that's very important. Coping with long delays is something that we're moving into much more now because we're starting to look at some of the more what we call delay tolerant applications. And that means now that we can, we can um, let's say, adjust the system not to cope with delay, but to exploit delay and, and be able to better optimize the system and so on. And the last thing there, um, this is delay tolerant, the last thing there is traffic differentiation. In our kinds of systems, we've got what we call our payload, which is our data shipping up at, at the qualities of service that are required of it. But we also may have control going down. Control can be of two types. It could be the computer system control, where we're readjusting the actual computing infrastructure, where we do have some centralized command. Um, or it could be actually controlling something. So it could be, for example, we have, we're building a smart water network, and we're trying to get it to uh, do lots of offline analysis and then control the water network in a much more flexible way. So these messages have to be, they have different qualities of service uh, uh, notions, and therefore we have to differentiate that traffic, and all the underpinning protocols have to adapt to allow that to maximize the chance of that happening with certain determinism. And also, some of these systems that I've, I've come across now are starting to look at where you have one communications mechanism and another to back it up. So you have two pieces of communications hardware. And when to choose which of those, or three or four, or whatever type of communications hardware, when to flip between them to maximize the actual communications is something that we're also looking at. So we're going to look at um, some of the projects that we have in our um, group. We started late, so I'll, I'll give it to five minutes, yeah? Um, so one of the things that we looked at is where we borrowed from nature, where we have uh, firefly synchronization. This is pretty much a pulse, pulse couple oscillator, 
whereby we can let the system go to sleep and as soon as it comes back up again, it can reconfigure itself to actually make sure the next time it wakes up, it will be in synchrony with all the other nodes. Now, we typically use that for two reasons. We typically use that for uh, when they've gone to sleep and the clocks have drifted. And also, we use it where we want to make sure we're forming a route, a random ad hoc route of data across a network so that that route always wakes up at the same time and sends its messages across. The reason I've put code on, on a slide is to show you how small the actual algorithm is. It's a tiny algorithm, but it's very effective and has wonderful uh, properties that can be propagated quite quickly out through a fairly large network of units or nodes. Another system that I wanted to introduce was the Fuse Underground Sensor Network. Now, the challenge in this was to have absolutely everything underground. And as you can see for the, from this, um, the, the, this is in Yarnton Mead in Oxfordshire. This is spring and this is winter, this is January. Um, it is a floodplain and the soil inside it is more or less like blue tech. So for those of you who are, uh, are RF people, you can imagine the challenge in low powered RF trying to get a message through that. We've managed to do it. We've managed to get a multi-hop of 80 meters there. And what we're doing is we're bringing in this information from the environment to allow us to do that. Um, and again, we're looking at clock drift and we're looking at the effects of the temperature surrounding the nodes to be able to understand better the quality of the data coming in. We also do anom anomaly detection and we've used anomaly detection to actually uh, reduce the, the amount of data uh, being shipped from base back up to the center. We can use it also to adapt the sample rate so when there's nothing happening, when it's boring, we don't ship much back. When it starts to get exciting, we can put the high samples uh, back up to base, but we've also used it to determine whether or not we can detect false data injection and when we find using benchmarks of smart grid systems that we are able to detect false data injection in those environments. We've also looked at control systems, so it's not just sensing and in this we're looking at how, this is a water network system, we're looking at how we can reduce the amount of samples and still maintain a notion of the state of a system. Uh, to allow it to maintain stability while it's being controlled. We also want to understand how we can make the system redundant so that if some p components of the system fail, what is the, uh, you know, through correlations of data and so on, how can we build a picture of the actual state of a system based on the fact that some components have failed and still maintain stability? And also, if the system is starting to have components run low in battery and so on, how we can uh, keep that system alive. We've done uh, uh, solar power and other uh, renewable energy and we can guarantee energy neutral operation. And we've looked at delay tolerance through use of mobile phones and as I said before, the use of drone technology. And we're putting this out in, we're currently phase one out in Hyde Park and phase two we'll be looking at uh, how we can suck up data in Hyde Park using both drones and, and we've got mobile phones working right now. So very quickly, what I wanted to say was there's a lot of parallels between the kinds of challenges you guys have and the kinds of challenges that we have answered in some parts. But obviously, the devil is in the detail, and this is where collaboration can be very productive. And this is where I'd welcome to talk to you after and in the break. And I wanted to sum up very quickly by saying this sort of sets of challenges are generally known in the computer world as cyber physical systems challenge where the environment impacts on the ability of the computation to compute and so on and so forth and that changes both spatially and temporally over time. So this is a nice challenge and this challenge is getting funded both in Europe and in the UK uh, and there's a lot of funding going into this right now so this is maybe something you guys might want to be interested in. So as I said at the start um, I felt like a bit of a fraud when I first came here because I don't really work um, in space, but you can hopefully see that there's a lot of parallels. And uh, I'll finish with a quote because I believe academics like quotes. <laughs>